So a lot of you have come here to hear me talk about artificial intelligence. And I will talk about that, but first I'd like to talk about something much more delicious. Butter croissants. <laughs> My Lieblingsessen is butter croissant. I like it so damn much that I've traveled to 127 different places to try the very best butter croissants in the entire world. In 2018, there's a chef in Melbourne, Australia, named Kate Reed. She was crowned as the chef who has created the world's best butter croissant. Now, if you're like me, I'm freaking excited about this. Of course, I instantly booked a ticket to Melbourne, Australia from Berlin, Germany. That's about 23 hours and about 1,200 euros. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you is a very common thing. I get to the airport. Yeah, yeah, I heard, the, I heard that. <laughs> a little delayed, and then, of course, a canceled flight. Now, I do what every 36-year-old mature person does. I complain on social media. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, I don't complain on social media. I complain on all the social medias. First, Twitter. Then, Instagram. <laughs> don't forget, Snapchat. But most important, most important, most important, it's Facebook. But do you know why? Because Facebook, they got comments. And comments are hilarious, because every time I post about a flight that was delayed or canceled, I get a ton of comments like this. Happens to me all the time. I hate that airline. That airport sucks. Pretty much the most useless comments in the entire world. However, there was one comment that was actually quite useful. A friend of mine, via Facebook comments, told me, that I actually get 250 euros for a delayed flight because of a legislation called EC261. Now, I never knew this, so it came to a surprise to me. Now, very quickly, please raise your hand if you had a delayed or canceled flight in your life. Currently, it looks like 92% of you or so. And then this point will not be a shock then, because every single year, 7.2 million people experience a delayed flight. That's about 14 times the population of Stuttgart. Now, according to the International Air Travel Association, in the next 25 years, we will see a 4% growth year over year in global travelers. And what does that mean for delayed flights? In the year 2042, we will be experiencing 20 million delayed flights a year which is about the population of the top 14 cities in Germany combined. And remember I told you earlier that you're owed compensation when you're delayed. And that amount, as of today, 2018, and every single year, is 5 billion euros owed to passengers who do not know they have rights. Now, 5 billion euros is a lot of money, and you can buy a lot of fun stuff with it. The first thing you can buy is two airports. <laughs> But, 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 a better thing you could buy is 64 planes. And then you could start your own airline, Air Croissant, <laughs> which I'm launching today. <laughs> now, here is a very shocking number. 87% of the entire world does not know they have any air passenger rights whatsoever. And it's pretty straightforward. There's actually only three reasons for this. The first reason, it's complex. Second reason, it's expensive. And the third reason, it's inaccessible. So let me talk about the complexity of it first. The EC261 legislation that I mentioned earlier is 49 pages and 5,000 words long. Just imagine you're at the airport, and you're delayed, and you pull up this 49-page document to make sure you're eligible. It's extremely complex. Now, the average compensation an airline will pay you when your flight is delayed is 350 euros. But a lot of times, for you to get that compensation, you need to hire a lawyer. And a lawyer, on average in Europe, costs 200 euros. It pretty much doesn't make sense for anyone involved. It's inaccessible. According to the American Bar Foundation in 2014, of all the people who needed a lawyer, only 15% of them actually hired a lawyer. But that's not the shocking number. The shocking number is 46% of people who needed a lawyer did absolutely nothing. 
It's complex, it's expensive, it's inaccessible. So for a moment, please imagine that there would be one lawyer with the knowledge of every single lawyer in the world that could give you advice at any time, at any place, for free. Currently, that is possible today with artificial intelligence. And let me explain how it's possible. Now, I mentioned that it's complex, and laws in general are very complex. And if you think about it, uh, the more information you have as a human, the better decisions you can make. But there's one problem with being human. You're capped in the amount of information you can keep in your head. However, with artificial intelligence, this is not a barrier. And actually, for artificial intelligence, complexity is not a challenge. It's a battery. Because the better and the more data artificial intelligence can have, the better the decisions it can actually produce. Artificial intelligence is inexpensive. Because every time it does an action, makes a prediction, or gives an answer, the next time it does that action, it'll be better at it, which then reduce the cost to come to the same action. So the unique economics of artificial intelligence is one of the best in the entire world. Artificial intelligence is accessible anywhere, anytime, even without internet. Now, there's two reasons that it is a topic today. The first reason is that the phone in your pocket today has the processing power of a supercomputer from the 1980s. Our ability to compute large amounts of data have far beyond exceeded what we ever thought was possible. The second reason is because of data. As of today, we generate and produce more data than we've ever done in the history of mankind. But the most shocking fact is, within the last two years, we have generated and gathered 90% of all the data in the world, which means every single year that our society exists, we generate and gather more data exponentially forever. And because of this, data is at such a transformative scale that artificial intelligence is effective. So, now France has pledged 1.5 billion euros to AI research in the next five years. China has seen an increase in 60% in VC investment in the last five years. And Israel has increased their investment in artificial intelligence by 16 times. Some are even calling it the next space race. Now, I'm an entrepreneur my whole life. And entrepreneurs, we love finding opportunity to create things that are impactful. But the last two years that I've worked at a company called AirHelp, what I see is not opportunity. What I see is a market inefficiency caused by rampant injustice. Now, in the world, there are many kinds of injustice. Here are a few more. Parking tickets that are wrongly given, speeding tickets that are given to the wrong person, disputes with your landlord. And these are very common, and there are companies today that are tackling these very issues with artificial intelligence. But what if we thought about this in a bigger sense? What if artificial intelligence took on criminal cases. But to really further this thought, what if our artificial intelligence was the judge of a criminal case? I'm going to pause right there for a second, because that statement sends chills down my spine. And it should also make you feel extremely uncomfortable. Because the idea that something could make a life or death decision that itself is not alive is extremely uncomfortable to think about. But think about for a moment, what makes a good judge? A good judge is logical, empathetic, and fair. But being logical is not always empathetic. Uh, and being empathetic is not always logical. And that's not to say you cannot be both. But it is saying you cannot be both all the time. Now, every single day, you get in a car, or you jump onto Ubon, or you take a flight somewhere. And every single time you do that, you put your life in the hands of technology, something that is not alive as of today. So every day, we actually already trust technology with our lives, and we've already given its permission to control our lives. Now, for every time our appetite for technology and progress grows, our hunger for artificial intelligence also grows. 
And what's more striking than what we want is that in the last 50 years, we've created some of the most innovative technologies in the world. But the shocking part is our, the rate in which we adopt new technologies. Now, it only took five years for America to adopt 25% of its population, the smartphone. Five years. And as you can see, every time we create a more innovative item, we are adopting it faster than ever. Now, as of today, if you did a Google search, booked a hotel, a hotel on, uh, on like a hotel site, called an Uber, or any form of technology for your phone or anything like that, there are layers of artificial intelligence that already exist in your day-to-day -day lives. The very fabric of your life is already sitting on top of artificial intelligence. One could say artificial intelligence is the foundation in which our society sits on as of today. But progress never stops at 60%. Because in the near future, and I do mean a very near future, artificial intelligence will not be a foundation in which our society sits on top of. Artificial intelligence will be the very structure our society lives inside of. So what do we do about such a fundamental change to how we live our lives? Well, we should do my absolute favorite thing, and I think you all know what that is, which is eat a lot of croissants. <laughs> but when you're eating these croissants with your friends and your colleagues and your family, what you should be doing is you should be discussing and agreeing and disagreeing and arguing and compromising. You should be doing what humans have always done which is discuss and debate and decide which is the best decision for the whole society to move forward. Because as the human society, if you do not decide where the future is, something else will. Feeling dunk.